Welcome to our monthly meeting. We're here to accomplish the business of schools for the sake of our students. We do want to hear from our citizens and there's time and public comment prior to action items on the agenda. Uh, tonight there's two comment times. One is uh, the generic, uh, if there's something non-budget and then there's one specifically uh, set aside uh, uh, for the budget. We also ask that your comments are limited to three minutes in order to provide equity to all speakers and ensure a meeting is reasonable in length. If you have more information that can be summarized in three minutes, please provide leave behind materials for the board's review. The moderator will ask you to conclude your remarks as time has elapsed. If you have questions during the session, you may ask for clarification from a school board member or school administrator after the meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming. Do we have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. We have a motion, Mr. Grove. Is there a second? Second. Second from Mr. Ubin. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. It's ordered. Is Ms. Campbell here? Uh, she is oh. not. I do not see her. I know she's busy with soccer. So. Soccer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's important to do 20 different things. <laughs> What's that? Uh. Oh, okay. Oh. Well. Okay. All right. Not funny. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. <laughs> well, we'll hear from Ms. Campbell next month. Okay. Ms. Check uh, donations. Should we review them? Uh, there's quite a list. Do we have a list of them? I don't think we have a list. You sure. do. Sure. We have a list, yep. A list under donations. Under the consent mm -hmm. agenda, there's a list. Do you want, do you want me to do it? Okay. Uh, so we have quite a few uh, for family engagement night. Uh, Bell Ridge Farm, Miss Deedle and Mr. Sands, Fat Tuesdays in Warrington, Flint Hill United Methodist Church uh, donated some nursing supplies, Miss Victoria Fortuna Ski Club, Miss Erin Hanback Family Engagement Night, uh, Headwaters uh, sponsored our RCHS Scholastic Bowl team for their state championship. Uh, Mr. Richard Johansson donated to the Ski Club, Monero Orthodontics, uh, Class of 2025, Ms. McKee and Mr. Avery, Family Engagement Night, Rappahannock County Farm Bureau, FFA Chapter, Rappahannock Football League, RCHS Athletic Department, Settle Excavating, Family Engagement Night, and Trinity Episcopal Church uh, nursing supplies. Great, that's great. Quite a list. <laughs> good. That's always good to see. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, the adoption of the minutes from our February meeting. Is there a motion to adopt these minutes? So moved. I have a motion. From Ms. Bynum, is there a second? Second. Mr. Grove, is there any discussion? All in favor, aye. Uh, I oppose no. It's ordered. Mr. Grove, have you had opportunity to review? I have, and everything looks to be in order. Uh, bills are listed under consent agenda in case anybody wants to review in a public document. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Push Mr. Rubin. Is there a second? Second. Second from Ms. McCool. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, 4.1 on the agenda for superintendent's reports is actually our digital, digital literacy and AI education update. Um, several months ago, it was brought up. Um, Ms. Bynum, I believe you brought this topic up. And it's one that's been on our priority list for some time because especially after COVID exacerbated the need for technology integration in the classroom, in the home, and in our instruction, uh, it has been a very hot topic in education. So. Um, in very Rappahannock style, we wanted to get in front of that, uh, and we uh, were introduced to a colleague in the field, Mr. Justin Locke, who is going to present to us what this might look like. So, Mr. Locke? Uh, he's the founder of Yancey Farm, where he leverages artificial intelligence to enhance community well-being. His background in biotechnology and healthcare, including leadership roles at Color Health and Reference Medicine, fuels innovations for education, sustainability, and child safety. A visionary entrepreneur, Justin strives to make AI a force for empowerment in Rappahannock County and globally. His work demonstrates a deep commitment to using technology for positive social impact. 
Welcome, Justin. Hey, Dr. Grimsley. Thank you. So awkward to have that read to me while I'm standing here. <laughs> and that mic, if you hold it towards you, it should pick you up really nicely. So we okay? can hear. There we go. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Justin. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, Dr. Grimsley. Um, let me start off just by giving a little background about Yancey Farm um, and a little bit about me. So I actually moved to Rappahannock County three years ago from San Francisco. Um, I'm that guy um, who came during the pandemic. Um, I burnt out horrendously in healthcare, building a COVID test. That I think about 1.7. Could you move a little closer to the mic? Is that better? It's echoing a little for me. Thanks. It's echoing for me too. Ah, so. oh, okay. That's better. That's good. We wonder, thank you. Yeah, I'm, just gonna, I'm really interested in your presentation. <laughs> Great. Um, Francisco, and I found myself in a place where there's just so much need. It's very clear that Rappahannock County is a remarkable place. There are so many phenomenal people here doing interesting things. But what seems to be missing, for me at least, in my understanding, is a, a thread that connects everyone together. And one of the remarkable things about artificial intelligence is that it, it can do that. It can connect people, regardless of the language they speak, the amount of education that they've had. Um, it's truly a phenomenal tool, and I'm very excited to share a little bit about it with you all. So, if you could move along. Thank you. So, what's very unique about AI companies is that they're entirely different to anything you've ever seen before. And what I mean by that is, these companies are able to operate in a number of different domains. So, if you think about a traditional company, Chick-fil-A, it makes food. That's their business. With AI, you can make food, you can farm food, you can market, you can advertise, you can do the entire process from start to finish because you have a tool at your side that is an expert in every single field on the planet, has profound understanding of almost every single topic, and works lightning fast for basically free. That's a pretty phenomenal combination of tools. So at Yancey Farm, we're focused on three particular domains. Um, the first one is just realizing the value of Rappahannock County. I think what's so interesting about this place is there is literally gold in the rivers here. Like it's a remarkably valuable place. And we haven't seemed to be able to commercialize that. We haven't figured out a way to maintain Rappahannock in a beautiful rural place and at the same time build opportunities for our community, for our youth, for our people. And so if you're interested in, in trying to do that, so that's domain number one. Domain number two, doesn't matter how much gold you have, unless you have a whole lot of people with shovels, you can't get it out the ground. And so that's very much an area of my focus. I'm trying to figure out how we can use tools, artificial intelligence tools, to bring the community together, to engage them in ways that they haven't been engaged before, and to let them communicate with each other in ways they've never been able to communicate before. And then lastly, uh, upskilling and training. It's very clear that the, the world has changed and is changing on a daily basis, and we need to make sure that everybody um, keeps up and nobody's left behind. In my day job, um, I do a lot of consulting for small businesses, and it breaks my heart because oftentimes I'll walk into a business that's been operating for 70, 80, 100 years. I did one yesterday, the plumber. They've got no clients. They're an 80-year-old business and they have no more clients. And the reason they don't is they don't have a website. They don't know how to build one. They don't have advertising. They don't know how to do it. They don't understand the digital world, but they are exceptional plumbers, so I'm trying to help them. So when you do big things, you need to keep your eye on the prize because as soon as you gain traction, people very quickly um, get excited about the money and the power. And that typically happens with success. And so I always like to lay out the three fundamental principles that we work hard at Nancy Farm to reinforce every day. The first one is equality. We have to make sure that everyone is equally successful. For we've got this huge divide in the world, and it's not getting any closer, so unless we actually start on a daily basis working to make sure that we bring people together, we're just moving further apart. Two is prosperity. I want to be successful. I know everyone else does too, so let's be successful. Let's let people be successful. And three is happy. I've got a two-year-old daughter, I look at her face when she's happy, and I'm so envious. <laughs> <laughs> and I want everyone to have that, and I'm working hard for that too. Finally, we can get onto some digital literacy. So, um, all of that is more, more or less about Nancy Farm. Um, I met Dr. Grimsley um, through her uh, reporting in the newspaper and various other places, and we connected and we started chatting. 
And something that became clear is that there is a distinct need for digital literacy in this community, especially in, uh, among parents. And so we really drilled down and figured out, how can we leverage this new tool we have called AI to do something incredible in the space of digital literacy, specifically around parents? And so that's what we, we designed. So where do we start? <laughs> There's this huge universe of possibility. Where do we really dig in? Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of pressing issues right now in, in, in the world. And one of the more important ones, in my opinion, is, is online child safety. We have so many kids who are being abused online, and frankly, nobody is doing anything about it. And I think it's time for that to change. These stats are probably things that you've seen before, nothing new. One in 25 children is solicited online. That is insane. Just imagine your small child getting a message from someone they don't know, someone you don't know, asking them to have sex. That happens to one in every 25 children. Remarkably, 51% of parents don't speak to their kids about being online. They don't have a relationship with their children and their children's digital lives. Which is unsurprising then that there are over a quarter of a million um, images and videos online of children being sexually abused. That number has increased. I haven't shown you the latest stats because there's some noise around it, but that number is going up, mainly because we're looking harder to find this stuff, and there's more and more of it the more we look. Thank you. And so naturally, the first question is, well, who's doing something about it? And I hate to tell, tell you, but no, no one really is doing very much. Um, I've got some news articles up here on the screen. Um, your first instinct might be that tech, big tech, are the people responsible for solving this problem. They're the ones who build these tools, these apps, they should fix it. They're not. I agree with you, but they're not. Then you would think, oh, well, Congress should do something. This is a major problem, it affects a lot of children. How many times have you seen a tech CEO sitting in front of Congress, apologizing, being berated? How much actual legislation have you seen? No. You think, well, the state should do something. The state just kicked the can down the road again on AI and children. They're not going to do something either. So who's left? This is it. We're the front line. I'm a big fan of Common Sense Media. Um, it's a great platform. If you haven't heard of it, it's worth a look. Their founder and CEO has this great quote. It basically says that when you're involved in your in children's lives online, they're safer. It makes sense. When you hold your child's hand when you walk down the street, they're just likely to run into the road. It's exactly the same online. So, what's the solution? Sounds easy. Involved, proactive, thoughtful parenting. Wouldn't that be lovely? Answer to everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of problems. But here's the problem. I'm a millennial, I'm 35. I don't know how TikTok works. I don't know how. I don't know what several of those apps actually are on the screen. I've never used them. How do we as parents look after our kids online if we don't even know what they're doing? It's impossible. At least it used to be. With AI, it's different. Suddenly we have a tool that knows all of these apps, how they work, their privacy settings, how to frame them, how to change them, what the risks are. It's all there at our fingertips. Just like that. Today. It never was before. So here's a little example. I don't expect you to read the text. Um, I went to um, an AI that I built, and I asked it for some help with privacy on TikTok. I said, I have a nine-year-old child. Um, I need to set up their phone to be safe on TikTok. And those are instructions right there describing exactly how to do it. Those instructions can be in any language, designed to be read by someone of any education level. And it can be written for any app on the planet in seconds. So you as a parent can sit down and you can ask what this brand new app is that your kid just brought home and get detailed instructions about how to set up privacy on that app, what the risks are, and what you can, as a parent can do and need to be mindful of when your child is using that particular app. This is a game changer. So the digital, digital literacy program that we've been building um, basically has three fundamental ideas. The first one is, we need to teach people how to use the world, the internet, the digital parts of our lives. Because like those covers I mentioned earlier, you just don't know. I'm standing up here talking to you about artificial intelligence. I don't know how TikTok works. I don't know how all of these apps work. We can't know. 
but we can teach ourselves. We can learn, and we can make sure that everyone has a really good understanding about exactly what the risks are and how to solve them. Second is responsibility, <laughs> technical responsibility. We need to teach ourselves, especially, um, and our kids that being online is just like being in the real world. You know, a decade ago, certainly I remember, you could sort of be anonymous online, it didn't have to be anyone. It's just not true anymore. Our online lives are real and they look back at us. And so we need to make sure that our kids and our parents understand that being online is being in the world and we need to do so safely and responsibly. And then lastly is community. I try to do things alone, it's very hard, it's impossible. Um, so we need to make sure that as we build, as we find out how to solve some of these problems, we do so in a way that gets the community involved, gets the parents involved. This room needs to be full behind me, full of people who are genuinely interested in solving some of these problems. And if we engage them, I hope we can. Okay, nearly done. Uh, four more slides. So, as I said, this workshop has basically three different programs, three different sections. The first one is, as I mentioned, um, this digital literacy. How do we teach people? Um, workshops. You guys are teachers, you understand, you need to get people in front of you to teach them something. So we need to do that here as well. We need to build workshops um, that really lay out the foundation for what the digital world is, how it works, what tools we have available, and how to solve some of the problems. How do we equip parents with the tools they need today to go home and have really good conversations with their kids about the digital world? And then have a follow-up conversation about how to be safe in the digital world. And then have another follow-up conversation, and another one, and another one, um, all the time, every day, once a week at least, um, making sure that our kids are safe, giving them the tools that they need to be successful. The, the next part of the program um, is very cool. Shane, you can move on, sorry. Um, I'm very excited about this. So one of the major advances in artificial intelligence is this idea called natural language processing. And what that means is that you can engage with software using natural language. Just like I'm naturally talking to you now, you can naturally talk to AI and it can understand you. Which, as someone who has an accent, um, I try and call, you know, this Idal Comcast, you go through the phone tree, it doesn't understand my accent, it's infuriating. Um, it's infuriating, I think it does. <laughs> Natural language processing is vastly different. It understands virtually every language, uh, every accent, every education level. And you can come up to the software and you can ask it something like, how do I change the privacy settings on my child's TikTok app? With a text message, or over email, or you can call it. And it can send you back detailed instructions in whatever format you want, image, text, video, it'll make whatever you want and give you exactly the instructions you need to make a difference in whatever you're dealing with in that moment, using just your voice. Third component really feeds into community. We need to think about putting resources in a place where everyone has access to them. And again, if we put a natural language processor on top of this, we can think about a, a website, a, um, a resource online that lets people arrive, an app, via email, text, call, whatever, and ask questions about things that are working in our community. If you're an agricultural family, perhaps your um, the issues you face with your children are different to if you are a weekend in Rappahanna, or whatever your situation might be. But if we have a community of like-minded people who are collectively doing the same thing together, we have a pretty good chance that we can help each other. And that's really my, my goal, we help each other. So, the big question, um, what's it all gonna cost? Um, as I said to Dr. Grimpley, I've seen your budget, I, I couldn't charge you anything, um, I refused to, <laughs> but we do need to find a way. And at the moment, we're exploring a couple of different options. One of our primary objectives right now is to raise a small amount of seed funding to really get stuck in and get started and get some proof of concept. Because this program, I think, is fairly revolutionary. And revolutionary things tend to take on a life of their own. And my hope is that as we can gain some traction, as we can see some positive results, there's a lot of counties in Virginia that have this exact same problem. A lot of counties in the country that have exactly the same problem we're trying to solve. And I don't see why the tools we're building today couldn't be applied equally as well elsewhere. And so I think we have a lot of opportunity to create a revenue stream from solving some of the problems that we face in our own community. 
inside group. So how can you help? Um, you can listen to me, so thank you very much. I appreciate your time. <laughs> uh, primarily, we're looking for introductions. If you know people in the community who are actively interested in this space, who are investing in this space, who are uh, philanthropists, who are curious and um, generally curious about finding ways to leverage AI in education, we would love a connection. We would love to talk to them. We might be able to help, we might not. But I think the more of us, the more conversations we have, the easier it will be to find the group of people we need to be able to move this idea forward. Last slide, I promise. If you'd like to learn more, please jump on our website. It's a little bit of a construction zone. I've been fairly busy, I'm sorry. Um, but there's a bit of information there, and if you dump your email in, um, you'll get daily updates. Uh, next week, we'll be start, we're starting to send um, weekly, potentially more often, updates on various things from how to be safe from the latest apps all the way through to um, summaries of meetings in the county, like the Board of Supervisors and School Board meetings. So um, stay tuned. We've got a lot of exciting things coming. Thank you for your time and your support. Appreciate it. Right. Can you hang up for just Absolutely. Please, questions. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question? I have a couple of questions. I, just, I wanted to just um, clarify. So this is sort of a you're sort of a pitch for to, to start you up. Is that right? I, I, I just want to understand what that they you know you're a West Coast guy. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to understand what what this. <laughs> This is my uh, my two million dollar funding uh, seed round. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I guess effectively, I'm, I am pitching you. I okay. think this is a very good idea. I would love your support. Um, I'm not asking you for money. Sure, to be you're fair. asking for support. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I do. I think you're right. I am pitching you on this idea, on this, on the idea of using technology, specifically artificial intelligence, to try and solve some of the problems that we haven't been able to solve up until this point. I'm just excited that Shannon got you to come to our meeting, <laughs> right? So I'm not sure how the link happened, but you had requested information about yeah. this, right? This is an exploratory. It's less than a year old, right? <laughs> yes. There's nothing like it out there. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing. I mean, we have to uh, digital literacy for our children. I mean, I, I, are we connected? My grandma, my granddaughter tried to. Um, she pinged me uh, with some link, you know, go to this app, and some app that she has, and she wants to communicate with me on this app, and... It's what app? No, it's some, it's the <laughs> clapping one, whatever the one with the hands are, I don't even know. <laughs> oh, right? But it's important to her, it's her life, and, and uh, we are disconnected, uh, and it is critical. And I, I would so Competency suggest. is... Uh, it's, it's a great, it's a great pitch and great time. It's a good topic. I, I would suggest that your fifty-one percent is low. <laughs> I would bet it's seventy-five percent. Yeah, yeah, it's true. A lot of these numbers come out of the UK, where there is a lot more research and a lot more transparency into what happens. Um, in the US, there is less transparency. Yeah. It'd be interesting to know what. Uh, you know, I'm I'm so old, I have crank phones, but. <laughs> what, at what age do, do kids get cell phones in today's world? I, I know what my grandchildren do. The average is nine. Nine? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. do that. We're 13. Yeah. Our family. So really nine. Crazy. Oh, I mean, I, kindergarten. My granddaughter is in kindergarten. It's She's active online. Mm -hmm. She hits me yeah. online. Well, that's frightening. I think I, I think it's a great time, it's a, it's a great plan. I think the school is pivotal in the community when it comes to parents and the children and whatever, and it's a really good starting place. Well, there is an online safety program coming up, right? Isn't that right, Chris? Lauren County Sheriff's Office is coming. Like Friday? Yeah. Like with the, to the Sheriff's Office, right? Yeah. At the high school. And it's at the high school, but it's sponsored by the Sheriff's Office? Yeah. In Warren County. I think it's the, the sheriff from Lawrence and what makes it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. well, I appreciate you coming, Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, this Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay. It is excellent information. It's good to get it out. Um, the website, I guess, is a good start, right? And if we've aroused any in interest in any of uh, anyone in the county, it's, it's good for them to be able to reach out to you directly. 
And also, I'm asking the board too, a little bit of a consensus if this is sort of what you were thinking about heading toward as like thought partners design what it might look like. You could create this for what it looks like in schools across. Well, I mean, I, I believe it should be part of the curriculum, personally. You know, it's, it's interesting, it's innovative in the same way some of the other things that we've done over the last decade. And, uh, you know, we are the ones that are, we're briefing at uh, the SBA. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and other people want to say, oh, how did you do that? Family Futures, we have counties saying, mm -hmm. how did you do that? Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, uh, commit to be fit. How did you do that? Uh, so all of the things that, that are innovative like this that we tend to start become a model uh, for others. And we, and we, should, we should try. Mm -hmm. We should try to lead. So anyway, let's see. Let's see. Uh, that move forward with continuing updating as we kind of develop a little more. But if, if what we have here is a um, you know a pitch to move forward with trying to see if there is interest in finding some grant funds or support to develop this model and build it out here to see what it's like, like piloting it. Well, we have so we have that parent academy thing. Mm -hmm. What do we call it? Parent university. Parent university. Yes. Uh, which would be a great. Uh, launch pad for it. Mm -hmm. I think about um, uh, what's it called? The college down there? Repsi. Repsi. Mm -hmm. Repsi mm -hmm. and, and yeah. maybe uh, yeah. using that as a, a launch place. Uh, and the engagement night, having different you know, yeah. workshops. You were here. There. Yeah. 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 Having having kids there as well. So it's basically getting those, as we have those forums, being thoughtful of this type of information for parents. To, and, and, and they'll probably be like me. Great idea. How come it never occurred to me that there's this gap that I need to close, mm -hmm. right? Throw a blank to something. And, and holding your daughter's hand, going down the sidewalk, it's a great example. Mm -hmm. Really, and we have to transport that picture to the digital realm or they'll just be in danger. Okay. So there we are. So anyway, I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else before we let him go? I just, I had one more question. I'm sorry, I had oh, one more question actually. Um, yeah, so so it seemed like in the beginning I was a little skeptical of your presentation because you, were, you said that AI could grow the food and package the food and market the food. And you can find all kinds of erroneous information on AI for sure because all it's doing is chewing up all the information that anybody has ever put out on the internet as if it's fact and then spitting it out. And that's an important thing for people to know as they engage with AI, that you can get a lot of erroneous information if you use it as, as something that you don't need to actually fact check or double check. You can find lots of, you can, I read about this a lot, but I'm, I'm very worried about it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm worried and I'm excited in, in equal measure almost because, mm -hmm. um, but it's good to, I mean, part of that education not only is just how do you make a setting on your phone to keep your kid off, but also, how do you keep your brain turned on when it's this other brain yes. that lives in a, you know, in a, <laughs> a lot of the data that. center? It's telling you what's true, and, and that's that's that was where I was kind of coming at this question with. So I'd love I'd love it if someone would stay current on this because we have a lot going on at school. I like I like the idea of having someone keep staying up to date on this really fastly, you know, very quickly changing world because we could put out something this week and then. In two yeah. weeks, change. something could change. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the problem. And the other part of it, too, the, the prompt for educators. That's a big piece of this that we have in our budget talking about uh, a more focus with our instructional technology as a huge need, and teachers yeah. have asked for that, and the standards are, in fact, requiring that with integration of computer science standards, digital ethics, digital literacy, AI integration. So we are going to need that focus. So we will have a, a central point here, too, on integration into classrooms. What does that look like? Yeah. How do you leverage the resources to teach, just like what you're saying, to differentiate yeah. those sources and understand you know, how you can use them for, for good and to better your writing to or your thinking, or how can you thinking, do? There's so many things. Replace right. your thinking. You know, I want yeah. to enhance our thinking, not okay. replace the thinking. And that's really important because we're at school, right? We're about thinking. <laughs> and we're not about taking, you know, taking thinking away from anybody. We're about being better thinkers and being more discerning within the fat, rapidly changing world. Even the internet, even though we have poor internet service, we're all on the internet here in Rapid County. Maybe more so than other places in some ways. Like we should probably just know that 
it seems like we need to take a step forward and we just need to figure out how, what that looks like over the coming school year, right? And then it, it, now as we can integrate uh, this thinking into the, for the parents, uh, we, when we have opportunity, we'll do that. Should I? Um, just one thing before I leave, or oh, before I sit back down. Um, one of my major blind spots is that I don't have a good relation, I don't have any relationship with other parents for the most part, especially of um, elementary and high school age in the county. So this is truly a blind spot. I have no idea what parents think of this, um, of AI generally, and you know, to your point about errors, yes, that's, that's a point for sure. And there are also issues of these models are uncensored. You could ask them about anything. Right. Think about that, anything. And they will tell you something. Not necessarily what you want your child to hear, but they will tell you something. Um, and so naturally, there's a lot of hesitation about this technology as, it, as there should be, as, as there needs to be. Um, and so I am very interested in hearing perspectives from, from parents, from people who don't necessarily understand the technology in the same way that I do, so that we can try and figure out together what the safeguards are, what the rail, railings are to keep everyone safe. So I would appreciate any exposure um, to your community so that I can help as best I can. Appreciate you coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating and terrifying yeah. at the same time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really scary. Thank you for bringing. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. It's scary. Terminator, Matrix, and like. And I should it, it, it seems like a, a good segue. We, you know, we're, we're doing all this connectivity, and, and Jerry's going to get all our landlines connected, and we're getting all this stuff done. It would be a perfect entree into into internet connectivity for every house in the county. It would be a good thing to kind of promote from that perspective, I would think. You can also see how um, the things that we're educating our young people to go do for the next 40 years <laughs> are going to be greatly impacted uh, as well. Uh, like we don't, we can't even conceive of yeah. what the the impact of of this AI is going to have for them. It's, the, it's that pivot that we need to oh. prepare them for. Yeah, yeah. it's a huge pivot. Yeah. We, can't even, so. we don't even know what it smells like. Yeah. It's a mission to Mars. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thanks. You're welcome. All right, item four point two is the calendar update. Last month, um, the board directed our assistant superintendent and the lead of the calendar committee to go back in and review. Um, again, so she has an update for you. All right. Good evening, Mr. Good evening. Chairman, Good evening. members of the board. Bill uh, Johnson. Yes, and um, I personally am very excited at the idea of IA because I'm looking forward to going in and say, please give me the perfect school calendar. For this year, but <laughs> go see him. You make it happen. <laughs> okay, so as Dr. Grimsley said, I was instructed to work with the calendar committee again to determine how we could have a week off for spring break and to review the three half days at the end of the school year. So the calendar committee reconvened on February the 21st. Um, we discussed um, the possibility of aligning spring break with Laurel Ridges next year, which is going to be March the 10th through the 16th, and that seemed like a good idea because we have quite a few students who are in our dual enrollment classes. Um, we did also look at Mr. Grove's idea as far as moving two days in March into April. Um, when we laid that out, um, it, it was a little bit chunky as far as the weeks, but the biggest concern that we had was that um, the, the, um, the time came right up on the SOL test window. I, I, yeah, I didn't have a schedule for that. Right, so, so that made us a little bit nervous. Um, we also, one positive, well, one, one definite positive came out of this in looking at the second calendar because on the first calendar we had our parent-teacher conference day scheduled for a Tuesday. We've done that in the past. We've tried to align parent-teacher days with days that the students have off so there's not a disruption, as much disruption. 
Um, but the teachers would definitely prefer to have those on a Thursday so that they're kind of at the end of the week after the long day. So we did make that change to the um, additional option. And then as far as the work days, um, we, we were able to get it down to two work half days at the end of the school year. Um, we, we had played with the idea of just adding another work day at, after graduation so that the teachers would come back. But that wasn't an option because summer school is going to start that very next week. So um, we ended up moving it down to the two work days. So with that being said, um, overall results from the second survey did support option three, which added a week for spring break the second week of March. Um, 55 of the respondents preferred option three and 45% preferred option two. So just kind of comparing the two results, um, we, we took a look at um, the, the majority of the people who responded to both of the scenarios were parents. So we wanted to take a look at, you know, what, what did the staff vote? And so for the first survey, we had 26% of the um, respondees were staff members compared to 24 on the second. 50% were parents both times. And then when we broke it down by staff for survey one, 83% were in favor of option two. And then when we did the second survey, 55% of the staff were in favor of option two. So not quite as many, but still the majority of the staff. So the recommendation from the calendar committee does still remain with option two as originally proposed. Um, however, the committee does understand the board's desire to, um, to work with the differing opinions and input from the variety of stakeholders. Um, overall, our ultimate goal is to ensure that we remain accredited and that our students are successful. So we will um, obviously um, comply with whatever the board decides. So thank you for the opportunity to come back. Any questions? Yeah, I, I was, it was amazing to me how there were more than twice as many respondents on the second survey. There were 203 who responded to the survey you, you did last month, and then there were 448 who responded to this survey according to well, your and, Is that correct? Uh, I, yeah, I would like to give credit to Holly Jenkins. She is my calendar um, graphic designer, but she also helps me with the surveys. Um, we we are we were a little bit concerned after we um, thought about putting the survey out on Facebook because I think that gave the opportunity for people to be able to vote more than once, not just um, if you had multiple devices. I think you may have been able to vote more than one time. Um, you know, I do think that more interest was created because we put it on Facebook this year, um, but. Um, I don't know if that had anything to do with the additional responses, but you know, again, there was more attention to the calendar this year, so that was accurate. And then, if 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 twenty five percent of that four forty eight were staff, that was one hundred and seven staff who participated, and then out of that. 45% would be 48 individuals. I just want to get those numbers. You're doing sometimes you do percentages and sometimes you do numbers, and it's a little, a little. It's it's. I just want to understand what what we're dealing with. You know what you know what what the public is saying. Um, so 55% would be about 58 of the 107 staff who wanted calendar two. Is that correct? Um, of the staff members. Yeah, you 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 you're asking us uh -huh. to defer to the staff. Right. Um, so 45% of that would be 48 staff members um, to 55 yeah, times 58 yeah, staff members. I don't think I brought the individual staff surveys with me. Is that something I sent? I think I sent that to you. I'm just getting this from your presentation, just trying to understand, you know, what what we're what we're looking at you know, what they well, and, and, and I mean <laughs> what I have this evening is the percentage I'm sorry yeah. I didn't bring the number with me right. I'd say that it seems significant to me that we had more than twice the responses and that we had I mean if 55% of the 448 people who responded to the second survey 
um, voted for option C, that would be 248 people, which is more than voted at all in the first survey. But I don't know if those are people, as you're saying. I mean, I, I just, right. I just, it's it's very significant to me that we have twice the respondents, and then we're not, and then we're not being recommended to um, adhere to the majority of that whole group. Well, and um, you know, as far as the calendar committee's recommendation for option number two. Um, you know, again, we did feel like that was the most educationally beneficial calendar um, based on the fact that we had, um, there was one additional um, instructional day that was in option two, 177 days in option two versus 176 in option three, which it's only one day. Second semester is when we do our heavy lifting for the SOL testing. Um, and first semester, we have that, that November break that's put in there. Um, we have uh, 100 and, around 185 students who did SOL testing first semester, and a lot of those are students who are um, in more accelerated classes, so there's an expectation that um, the, the results for them, that there's not going to be as great an impact when we have days off for them. Second semester is our heavy lifting for the SOLs. We have all the elementary schools, so that is probably around 450 students who SOL test. So we really try to protect that second semester as much as we can. Um, and then again, the um, staff was was very um, very much in agreement that they really felt they needed those three half days at the end of the school year versus two. Um, just to get everything closed out and to, especially this year, be ready for summer school starting the very next Monday. And then just, you know, we can't predict what the winners are going to be like with um, the, the spring break in option three that is coming the second week of March. And I just, you know, I see, I, I don't want to see a scenario where we hit a big snow, we have a week out the first week of March, then we have a spring break the second week of March, and then we're out two weeks trying to, you know, get the kids back into the routine. So, again, I mean, that's the thinking of the calendar committee, but the calendar is the job of the school board, and we understand that. All right. So, uh, any discussion? We will be taking a motion. Uh, uh, at the end, it's obviously very close. It's always very close. It, yeah, it seems to me that that it's option two in the, in the, of the uh, judgment of the, the professionals, the people that are teaching our kids, is the appropriate option to take. Then that's the option that I think we ought to be taking. I think you know, I've spent 34 years in a school, and I can tell you that uh, being able to align your calendar with your with your results and your your testing and the things that that actually we are credited for, I and mean, we were responsible for, and we have a commitment to meet those needs, uh, pretty much outweighs a five-day vacation, in, in my personal opinion. And I would personally, when we get to that point, I'll tell you, I will be voting for option two. And I just, I just, another thing, I did want to understand what other schools around us are doing. And back here, all of the schools around us have a Easter week, the week before Easter for that vacation. So I'm wondering if everybody else has a educationally unsound calendar or? Okay. how we're doing this like, like I, I just really want to understand it because, because it's a, we're doing something that's different from what other folks do and i like the two breaks personally i enjoy that I, i'm happy to vote for option two i just really I, i'm i'm also in favor of the, the at least three days at the end of the end I think the half teachers days need like, those yeah. <laughs> half days if we were to go with option three i'd put monday as a half day as well but i mean just moving forward That's do you know what surrounding counties do my um, understanding is they, they, they don't take anybody. They, they set their schedule. 
if yeah. you look up those seven zeros. That's why I don't know. I didn't look up the schedule. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so we did look at the calendars that were around us. Rappahannock County has always been unique in how we do our school calendar. Mm -hmm. And honestly, um, I, I think the phrase that keeps going through my mind is if it's not broke, don't fix it. We've been accredited. Our students are learning, our students are being successful, and um, you know that's that is something that we you know look at each year. Um, if if those things were not working for us, then we would be looking at making bigger changes to the calendar. So when did we go to the two spring breaks? Because we didn't always have two spring breaks. Right. It a lot was, of parents who remember when we had a new perspective. Right. It was it was several years ago. It was when they changed the six years when they changed the SOL schedule. Right. At the beginning of the year. We, we switched it over because it was together. such a long haul with no break whatsoever. And the kids and staff were burning down and we saw them with big freaks and disciplinary action. Because kids were in here for six or eight weeks without a break. Getting ready for SOL. I'm sure it was the Chris, result you of the the mic, Chris? Did you move into the mic? There was like six or eight weeks of, of no break when kids and staff were burned out. We saw disciplinary increases go up and then the weather also played into it. So it was easier to work around a five day weekend here, a five day weekend there versus the spring break and that we were out. The year I graduated, we didn't come to school for about four or five weeks because of the weather. We, did, we, did, we had to get a pass in the state and you, you never know what's going to go on. It's a little easier to make up that weekend or those days. But teachers and staff were begging for a break in March and then again in April because it was such a long haul and kids were burned out. It's not a nine to five job where they're making widgets. They're cramming all this information in their head that they need to know. And then they're getting ready for us on top of it. Kids are burned out too. I mean, I'm saying it would be cool if, if it fell, you know, I'd like to be off in the fall. But if it gets us accredited, it gets their training, it gets them, you know, where they need to be, it keeps us on track. It's got to be built around the education needs of the kids, first and foremost. Did we have accreditation problems when we had a whole week off for spring break in the past? It's not due to that. There's a lot of mitigating factors. This school has been improvement before in years 2011 through 2013. We were in school improvement where the state was coming in. And yeah, that was rough. And then we did have a, a week long. Um, but there, I, it's hard to attribute one factor. It's just there are many factors and many different well, uh, opinions on it. And we do have, what, how many times the number of parents that we do staff to that have the ability to. Well, this is the reason we, we switched to going, coming back earlier in August and getting the first semester done yep. before the winter time instead of taking Christmas break and coming back and now trying to do exams and get called up and then shift over to the next semester. It was such a mess. And then you throw weather into it. Who knows? Who knows when you're coming back? You're here one day, you're here two days next week. All right, we got exams. Are you ready? Mr. No. Mills, you must have been here when they moved. We were one of the first school districts to go back earlier in the yes. area, and then it caught on and everybody started doing it. It was more instructionally sound. We did do that, I yeah. remember. Um, so, yeah. So just, <laughs> I do It's the will of the board to weigh the, these it's things. It's been two. I appreciate the fact that you went back to the drawing board and, and made an attempt. Next to year. accommodate next, year. Well, next year's going to be again I mean, <laughs> and uh at the committee you know too yeah. so a lot of work it's, it is a lot of work and it's appreciated and i appreciate you doing it another round uh, based on our feedback thank you for your patience thanks all right 4.3 budget time yeah. Um, so we could do this a number of ways. We've done it differently before. So um, I was going to ask you, Mr. Chairman, would you like us to go through the sort of the why and the what before we get into the how we did it, or the why and the what? Yes. <laughs> yeah. What is good, good, and then we'll get the highlights. Added some things to this. Desire, yes. desire, yes. desire yes. Really good additions. Thank you. It's very well done. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate Third it. Out of yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. The jail art said it included in there. Yes, we need that. <laughs> All right, so let me pull this up. Okay, so we'll go through the, the large report with all the cute children who are our children. It's not AI generated, these are our children. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> you didn't push your button? 
Uh, so typically, this is the budget report we do put out each year and always reiterate that to our stakeholders that everything that we do in the budget is supported by our comprehensive plan and driven by the strategic goals based in, the, in our comprehensive plan. Those have not changed, and we did have an update back in November, every odd year, as statutory required, um, to give you an update on those goals. Uh, so that's where we base the work of the budget to be sure that we can provide resourcing to meet those goals. Uh, the conceptual framework is built around our Road to Remarkable uh, um, and the profile of graduate. What do we want children leaving here with and being life ready has been the root of that. A little message from me that reiterates those, um, those priorities that we have already talked about in budget development, comprehensive plan goals. And on the online version of this report, there are links to all these resources too, so on board docs you can click to the larger document should you want to read some more. Uh, teacher staff compensation remains top two priority for our teachers and our staff and our parents in the community every year. Those are always the top two. We want to keep our high quality teachers. Uh, so that can be a big challenge because staying competitive with Northern Virginia area and even those districts that are our size is very difficult and costly when you only receive 17% of what that costs from the state. So that's one of the unique challenges that we have to do this. Um, technology and digital ethics education, this is something we've said has to be a priority. Our kids are online more and more. And even if we don't have great broadband connectivity, everybody's got cell phones and get, has email and gets online and has these apps. Um, and even after COVID where everybody, all these devices and connectivity was provided for families, um, you know, it was a rush to get everything out before we could really safeguard all of that and integrate into the curriculum what that looks like. So we have an interesting um, opportunity in education to really deal with this in a meaningful way. So that our budget supports that, not in a huge way, but it does help support that. Um, and then continue with capital improvements the best we can. Um, the infrastructure operations line in our budget still supports this, so um, we're going to keep hammering away at what we we have started. Uh, so our performance highlights throughout the years are listed. You had this update back in, I believe, September from Karen Ellis. A lot of work being done on this front, a whole lot of intervention. Um, we have, uh, like she had mentioned before, Ignite, Zern, Lexia, Varsity Tutors, all of these new platforms that are being paid for by the state. So anytime that we can get our hands on something like that, that would cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to utilize to support our children, we're, we're going to use it. <laughs> so uh, we are using those in a big way, um, and we are seeing some incredible data already. Uh, so I anticipate we'll, our next accreditation report will be very, very um, positive. Enrollment summary here. Um, here's the breakdown of our demographics. 792 students enrolled at the time that we pulled this report. So we are, and that's preschool through 12. So that number is coming back up, and you can see that trend chart that I provide every year. Uh, so we saw that 10% dip over 10-year period, um, and then it starts to plateau now come up a little bit. So that's exciting to see as a public school. We need children. That's good. All right, and then the understanding revenue uh, slides. These are really, really important. So we have staffing tools, and we have calculation templates and, and items that we have to use that the state provides. So what that does is it breaks down for your community, filter through your local composite index, in alignment with the standards of quality, how many staff you need to teach your students based on the, the requirements in the code. And then it will tell you, okay, of those many staff members, this is how much the state is going to handle, and you are responsible for the rest. Okay, so that's why it's really difficult for us with our local composite index to even meet the regular requirements of who we need. So even for, you, you need a principal in your school, you have to have one, but the state will only fund a certain percentage of that. And anybody that is not, um, that is considered uh, instructional support positions is also capped. So we've talked about that support cap. So not only does that run through your local composite index, your support staffing is then subject to another cap on prevailing costs. So you're really getting such a, a small fraction of state support for those positions. They say, yes, you have some flexibility, but you definitely will need them. Okay, so this is a, 
a tough topic for us. Uh, so supplemental basic aid and the school innovation finance task force. Um, this has been an issue that for the last several years we've been working on. Um, out of SIFT came recommendations. Recommendations for how we can, um, as a community, get around this issue and really help advocate for additional funding. Uh, so we have been pretty successful in making a lot of noise, as tiny as we are, and having so few votes <laughs> that I feel like we've made some headway. Um, the, if you remember last year, we had a bill um, that went through all the way, 100% through the House. Uh, looked very promising, Every, it was bipartisan support, and then the Senate Finance Committee at the uh, kind of end of the cycle said, well, hold on, we're going to put the brakes on it because there's a JLARC study. And the JLARC study is going to tell us everything we need to know about, you know, how we should fund schools more um, equitably. So, all right. So JLARC study is released. And you do have information about that report. And it's so great. We actually sat at the table for hours with JLARC to help inform them because we had been doing this research through SIF. Um, and lo and behold, we were right <laughs> that they, uh, the schools generally are very underfunded by the state, but that rural districts, and even more so tiny districts like Rapid Haven County with the very unique situation that we have um, are very, very underfunded. So definitely not adequately funded. Um, and it does cost more per student, a whole lot more, to try to gain that economies of scale that you need to do what the state says you have to do. Um, so there's some information there. The whole report is worth reading if you haven't. Um, it is informing a lot of policy now, a little bit backwards, because they're throwing a record number of education bills right now through the old formula, even though knowing it's broken. So that's a tough point, too, that we're going on. Uh, so what does that look like for per pupil expenditures? This is important because I think all of you have probably heard you're spending way too much per student in a, such a small school. Why is it so much? So if you break that down, it's really not very high with as far as considering other localities. It's pretty um, in line with those. In fact, probably under with the, what the county spends per student. We do have a lot more grant-funded programs. So when you do have grant-funded programs, you're spending more because there are expenditures tied to that. If your denominator is not changing, that's going to make that number go up, right? So just keep that in mind that the, the cost per student is relatively in line with what other districts are doing that don't have these other programs that we have. Um, of course, we have access to federal grants, not a whole lot. You'll see that we're noticing a trend, of, a downward trend with a lot of our regular federal grants, including your title programs. Um, so we'll be watching those, but great programs, they do help us a lot, except for like Title I is your uh, reading support, um, targeted interventions for reading and math, but we have historically, when we um, first had to have a reading specialist funded that position through Title I, and it wasn't supplanting, it was a new position, we definitely needed that position, I believe that was rolling right out of school improvement actually, back then, if I can remember that far back. It's like 15 years ago. But in that case, so we were able to use our Title I funding. Perfect. Had to add a staff member, had different funding to use it. All of the federal uh, title programs have a no supplant clause. You cannot take that federal money and supplant what's obligated in your own county budget. So you have to be careful with that. Well, we've always been able to cover that. Well, new this year, coming in right at the right time, we were implementing Virginia Literacy Act and all these other requirements, you can no longer fund your reading specialist in Title I. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and, and that's the federal state. It's okay. state. Yeah. So it's a state rollout because of the Virginia Literacy Act implementation. So now you can't access your Title I funds to, because this is reimbursable through the state. We reimburse through the state what we spend out of our, our title program. So, We've had to be really creative on how we deal with that because we still we've got to have your reading specialist. You have, especially with all of these um, new regulations around the Virginia Literacy Act coming out. So um, that was a another change. Was, was there a rationale for that? Did they give you a various rationale? rationale with the new money being provided for that implementation? Some of it subject to our inequitable funding formula. Some of it not. Some of the set aside funding that we were able to get in one fell swoop, we did, we were able to use for um, 
the training we needed for some of these new programs, uh, combating um, chronic absenteeism, tutoring, th those types of things. So we were able to use that funding for that, but um, they are funneling some more uh, Virginia Literacy Act funding through that formula. So that's important to note. Um, your special education funding, of course, very important. Don't know what we would do without it. That does fund staffing. Hopefully, they pray that they do not pull that from covering our key staffing because that does cover our uh, big portion of our assistant superintendent salary because that's special education is the big part of her role, um, and then uh, some other aid support, instructional support, and that's a that's important too. Our Perkins. Uh, funding that helps us with our career and tech equipment and uh, training for teachers that's really and some certification so uh, that's staying pretty stable in fact I think coming down a little which is surprising but it's not that much it's like thirteen thousand dollars <laughs> um, and then what's unique about this year too is now we are seeing the sunsetting of all the ESSER and COVID funding right so the, this funding is going away um, you can see here sort of a listing of how we use the CARES funding, ESSER, GEAR funding. Um, ESSER 3 is encumbered. We will have that spent up at the end of this year, um, finishing up for some of our, like, virtual Virginia. Um, and I think a little bit of some specialized tutoring support and supplies. But other than that, it's already encumbered to be spent out. Uh, so we, we were very careful throughout the infusion of these dollars not to use them for what we knew would be uh, long-term recurring expenses, just because you don't want to fall into that fiscal cliff. Um, but what it did do, I think, is soften the blow from some of the high costs of certain like materials and supplies and cleaning supplies and things that were permissible uses. We were able to use those dollars for some of those one-time expenses, but now that the rate has gone up, we probably soften the blow a little of what that actually costs. So you, you'll see that a little bit in your um, in your overall budget, especially with like the buildings, maintenance, those um, everything has come up as far as um, supplies, contracted services, paper. Yeah, <laughs> paper. Gail gets on us all the time for the paper. That's why we didn't do a whole lot of the big budgets. If anybody wants one, see me afterwards. We'll get one. It's a lot. Yeah, paper. Going through a lot of paper. All right, so the school budget, what's new? We continue to support um, the academy models. We do believe that's a way that we can achieve uh, a lot of the goals that we have set out in the comprehensive plan. Health Science Academy is still moving. Um, it does change year to year based on the needs of the students, um, but we're able to be pretty responsive to that need, as well as provide more of a community connection now that we have Catherine Waters. Uh, working with us and, and pulling um, more into the emergency services realm, which is really neat, and it's a need of the county as well. Ag Academy is still busting at the seams. FFA is very, very um, active, over 90 members already. Um, so that is one of our most popular programs, and the classes fill up as soon as we open them. So yeah, that's still supported here. Uh, the Fine Arts Academy uh, is being ready to present to you in a more consumable format. Um, has, um, Ms. Glee Page has done a great job um, collaborating with RAC and the other folks in, in the fine arts and performing arts to put together a, a neat package. So we will present what that looks like on paper to see it actually uh, come to life. So excited about that. The Trades Academy, I'm so excited about this. Uh, this is a big one that we've been working on for many years. I, I think I talked to you about this in 2000 and nine when I was CTE director. We had started this program in Middletown at the Laurel Ridge campus there um, where students in their junior, senior year at that program would go for a two-year program. It's like governor school for trades kids, okay? And you come out with certifications in HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and welding in the two-year program with those actual uh, ready-to-work credentials. Uh, so the one in here uh, is starting with rising seniors. Uh, ready to launch next year, um, and they will come out with, um, I believe they have HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and welding, just like we, we have, I have a parent up here who's excited about it too. Um, and the great thing about the costs associated with Trades Academy are they, they are very, very minimal. We already send a bus to that campus for the time allot, allotment 
Um, for Mountain Vista Governor School, those students would ride the same bus, so there's not additional transportation costs. Laurel Ridge has a whole lot of grant funding to support this, uh, so they are using every bit of that, and the parent cost is very small. So anything that we may see with this, we believe we can cover through Perkins pretty easily and help with some certification testing. Um, so there's really no look, added local money for this. Uh, but very exciting. We've been working on this for over a decade to get the <laughs> so. Um, driver's education behind the wheel. This was another very popular program. Um, the parents brought this up at ball games. And it was just that we heard them saying this and after COVID that they could not find a, a place for their child to go learn to drive without paying an astronomical fee and traveling very far because they were so backlogged after, after COVID. Uh, so we did the research, we were able to get a grant through the Northern Piedmont Community Foundation to purchase our driver's ed car and certify through the Virginia Department of Education um, and hire on our part-time staff. And we have, it's been very, very popular. It's always running, I, I think she said she had almost 100 kids by now already in the first year. Um, and so that's very popular. It's also available to our non-enrolled students, so uh, homeschool, and uh, private school students have been taking advantage too. The cost is a little bit higher for them because we cannot receive state reimbursement. Once you get it going, it's the startup cost, but the state will reimburse pretty much all of the costs, and the offset is what you charge the families. So um, it's a great program. We're really excited. It probably saved a significant amount in their time and their gas going to where you have to take the program. Absolutely, and a lot of them were saying that they were just waiting until their child turned 18 because mm -hmm. it was such a barrier. Yeah. And that's a huge barrier for the family. So uh, we, we heard them loud and clear, and it was very, uh, it was becoming a theme. I was like, wow, I didn't realize it was such an issue. So going to ball games and see what you find out. <laughs> um, wellness center, a fit kids clinic, um, we are continuing that. Um, and also building additional collaborations with RAP at Home for some exciting possibilities there as well. Um, so we, we do have, um, we did hire a new telepresenter after uh, we had some turnover in the <laughs> healthcare field. It's very tough to keep um, people in that, but uh, we're very excited with our hire now and she is so excited and enthusiastic about building out everything from the grant. So, people need to send their kids. She yes. has to stay busy. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, mental health services will continue. Um, our mental health innovation team has been uh, so crucial in making sure that students are getting connected to the professionals that they need, some clinical, some in-school-based uh, counseling services, uh, but they are so busy. They are very, very, very busy. Um, and for such a small school, you'd be surprised at how busy they are. Um, but I, I can't imagine what we would do without our social worker and without these folks. It's incredible. Um, so we will continue to support them through our, we have some grant funding there as well. Um, so then on the next page, you'll see over the years our, um, the review of previous budget cycles and how much we have asked the county to, to contribute. For this budget that we are proposing, um, which of course is without the supplemental basic aid amount that would have reflected the cap being removed, uh, we are proposing 10.1 million coming from the county, which is a 725,674 dollars more than we did last year. Um, which, you know, considering everything we had to grapple with to um, with the new state mandates, it's pretty actually low for, for what it costs. Um, however, with the understanding, if the cap does get lifted, it's not over yet. We still have a veto session. The governor still has a say. Uh, the conference budget that was released is already showing more revenue already than what was that we projected here. This year, we were very careful and we're playing very cautiously, taking the lowest uh, of the, the amendments. The conference budget, I believe, has a little over 200,000 more. 212,000 more um, dollars coming in, so that would reduce the amount that we would need to um, receive from the county should that be finalized. This is the worst case? Worst case. So what we're proposing is worst case. As far as what we know now, <laughs> I hate to say that, but something yeah. really yeah. wacky, like a skinny budget or something, which they right. can't do this time because we're at a fresh yeah. biennium, but you never know. <laughs> While you're still on on this page, uh -huh. do you mind? Um, oh, please jump in wherever you're you're already, 
Have they already calculated the LCI for the biennium? Yes. We're stuck. Yes. Oh, yes. Right. We're actually much higher than 0 0.8000, 0 0 is the highest you can yep. get in the cloud tool. Um, so the budget structure, we have different categories um, that the, the expenses are tied to with the revenue. Um, so we try to break those down by the largest categories that usually get people's intention, um, attention. Of course, instruction, as it should be, is our largest expense because that's, where, that's what we're in the business of. Um, that's your salaries and benefits of all your instructional personnel, your classroom instruction lines, your guidance, all these services. Um, the next one is operations and maintenance funds, um, so that, that did take a jump this year too. Like I said, costs of everything are going up. I'm sure you've experienced that in your own life, going shopping. Um, uh, let's see, administration, attendance, and health is usually a large one. That's allocated for your board services, any executive administrative services, specialized personnel, all your fiscal services, health services, social work, and psychological services kind of are under that umbrella. And then transportation, and we talked a lot about transportation <laughs> in our joint meeting, um, and I, I did put a link to that presentation if you want to look, because there are so many pieces to that. Uh, so looking at a little dollar bill graph, this is sort of what the percentages look like. Start dancing. Saving money. <laughs> you have to walk. You don't want to put you to the street. Saving money. Saving money. Saving budget cuts. Sorry. <laughs> so understanding instruction, we did break it down um, by each function, so you can see what these um, the description of each category, which what function, how much of the budget uh, was did we ask for at this point in time in fiscal year twenty four and then versus the proposed for FY25. Um, so that way you can really see where the adjustments are made by function for this proposal. Uh, we thought that was a little more useful than just having that figure without a comparison to, to know where, um, where those changes were made. Um, understanding the admin, attendance, and health category. So this is where you'll see your compensation, school board members, your attorney's fees, uh, contracted services, executive administration, um, all of those services that are under that umbrella that we talked about. Transportation only has two functions, so it's not an easy to break down. But I see this admin services okay. is oh, significantly less. Yes, less. we did make some cuts. Yeah, you, you, um, you, you, you finished the office attrition. We did, through attrition, we were able to absorb um, some of those functions. Now for executive admin services, personnel services, and those support services in that category, standards of quality actually gives you flexibility and projects that we need 18 and a half people. We have eight. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it, it says you need 18 and a half, so I'm just saying, we have eight. Yeah, I mean, it's a good thing, that's right. <laughs> We'll have multiple jobs in the office. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we did that, um, so we do have, that's important to know. Okay, thank you for bringing that no, up. So I guess now's a good time to say that. So school finance is very complicated. And when you have the different tools through the state to function from, it can be difficult to align with actual compliance. So we've done a lot of work over the last seven years making sure we were being more even with what is what is required, but also putting out a quality product. But being in compliance, we're sensitive to the fact that many of our, uh, the demographics of our school community vary very much from the demographics of the, the county as a whole. Um, and the same clientele that are impacted by significant tax increases are also the families we serve in the school. So we have those sensitivities when we, when we do this. So trying to provide that, that balance. That being said, we have tools that we have both constructed and collaborated with the state to provide to be able to help because the CALC tool is very cumbersome and it does break things down into percentages. So it's like, look, I have this many kids in this grade. I have this much, I have this many special needs. What do I do? <laughs> That's what we need to know so we can be compliant. So we do have those tools now that really help. So to give a, we have little, almost the same amount of students as about 2014, 2015. 
coming coming back in, in some of that population. We had 177 FTE, I meant 2017, not 2014, sorry, 2017, um, 177 full-time equivalent positions then. Now through the years, through attrition and diversifying endorsements, that was a big challenge for us because before you would have to have just one single endorsement to teach a, a section. So we incentivized teachers getting additional endorsements to have more flexibility because we were having trouble filling all those sections, right? And, and being able to offer all of these things. So we were able to do that. We have 143 FTE now, 177, 143. We have 53 full-time equivalent positions with multiple endorsements doing additional jobs. Um, so doing multiple jobs. Yeah, multiple, it's two right. or more. Right. Uh, so if you kind of map that out based on whether that would be another. Yeah. 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 But that was another full time equivalent person for each of just those 53. I guess it's somehow, right. like Carol Johnson, like eight jobs. <laughs> but if you, if, <laughs> if you did it, um, you know, if you multiply that out by, uh, and some are instructional support positions, so not all are administration either. Teachers, we have multiple teachers doing many things. We have school nurses who are ADs. We have, you know, it's just a very different landscape. Um, that has saved the county millions of dollars in personnel costs. Uh, so it's important to know. And we have a very dedicated, hardworking staff. Um, transportation we talked about. Um, in this budget, we did not put the bus in there. We were hoping for that supplemental basic aid. Uh, we have communicated with the county, saying, you know, let's work together on some of our capital, and we know there's a, you know, a lot of conversation on capital and um, that area. So we, all we used in this budget was our 200,000 infrastructure operations line to go toward that. So we didn't even meet the full capital line. Um, So our budget summaries in all of the uh, categories are listed here on page 25. So you can see where it's all broken down uh, for a grand total budget of $15,053,387 as our bottom, bottom line. And then um, the following pages, we talked about this during budget building blocks, so those are just a repeat of where the salaries are. It's very difficult for Rappahannock to keep up with salaries, like I said, because if the state says we're going to get a 3%, we're, we mandate a 3% adjustment, you will get supplemental, a compensation supplement toward that money. Well, those counties that have a much lower LCI get a much higher amount to do that, so they say, wow, they're giving us that much to do three, let's do six. And then they try, they get around that way. With Rappahannock, we barely make it to be able to do that three or five or um, those adjustments. So um, we're falling a little down at the beginning year salaries uh, compared to the districts around us. We did gain ground in the compression work we did, and this is based on this year's. We didn't do a whole lot of work to it other than applying the three percent into the salary scale for teachers. I'm just curious about this zero years mm -hmm. column because these seem to be in order of diminishing, but then. 49 is bigger than 46. It's not. It's up there. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. It's over there. I get it. Yeah. So yeah, first year, your first yeah, year zero I scale see. teachers. Yeah. We fell down a little bit there. We tried to, but we did gain a little ground where you'll make more money quicker in those first five. Uh, so by year 15, you see we're up right in the middle, and we gain ground there when you're trying to solidify your workforce and, and maintain and retain your, your good people. Um, so that was the thinking behind that. Um, and then the other, and then you can see the, the salary scale. If you have a master's degree or a doctorate or even EDS, you do get a, a supplement for those things. Uh, the scale that we looked on doing a lot of work to this year was our bus driver scale. Um, that has um, taken quite a lot of scrutiny, especially with the huge bus driver shortage we're seeing everywhere. And we have had, you know, trouble recruiting new drivers. Uh, so we're in a, a slightly better place on that, but still, um, you looked at our scale before, it took you 10 years to get a pay bump, really, um, in the way our scale was. So we did some comparison work, so we condensed that to five. 
So there's a zero to five scale, and six to 10, and so on and so forth. Um, and that also honored some of our drivers who have been at it for 20, 30 plus years, who want to continue on, but uh, just haven't seen a raise in a long time. <laughs> so uh, that's, that helps as well. And then we also had to deal with the adjustment for minimum wage at 13 to 15 an hour. Um, doesn't sound like much, but it does impact quite a few of our staff. Um, then on the table below that on page 29, you can see why costs are so high. I mean, there were, I remember when I first started here, there were years, I think we went like seven years without an actual raise. If you get your cost of living step. And then sometimes they would freeze the salary scale and then drop me down, and we used to love that. Oh my goodness. So you can see the state was really trying to catch up for work that they, they missed out on. So um, that's what you see here, but look at all those, I mean, we've dealt with 15% in the last three years. That's an astronomical cost to, to wrap in. We've done it, but <laughs> it's, it's tough. So this year calls for plus the thousand dollar bonus mid year that we had to do that year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so staff benefits. It was a priority of the board that since we did pass on a premium increase last year that we did not this year. Uh, so we did protect that. Uh, this year, uh, and unfortunately, we did see another high premium increase at 11 percent. Uh, so Stacy will break down those numbers further when we get to hers, but uh, that's a very costly, uh, costly premium increase. The good news is we did have an analysis done of all our claims data and our trends and, and went through all of those pieces. It, it seems to be that those claims will be falling off and we're coming to a better period in time which happens and you know, that's how the pendulum swings with health insurance. Usually you have a couple of bad years and then, especially after COVID, everyone is seeing sort of something similar. Uh, but the good news is our, our package, our benefits package is pretty competitive. Um, and having the uh, high deductible option that is still a zero option for your single subscriber with an incentive for an HSA is a great off ramp if, there every, if things did get too crazy. And the board did say that's the package that we, we will support. Uh, it gives that option, but it also gives families options now to do that. Um, not saying that will happen. I, I like all of our options. There's a lot of choice, and employees get to make those decisions. Um, but how much the um, schools contribute to each of those plans could be adjusted based on that. But we did make we made no changes this time. We kept it stable as the board requested. I have a quick question. Sure. Our staff with regards to health insurance reform? Excellent question. So, we, the question was how do we educate our staff? It's a great question. Um, anytime you mess with insurance, it can be very, very uh, one of those controversial subjects. Uh, so, and we're taking our time with it. And really, um, we brought on Pierce Group benefits, if you recall, several years ago. Um, they're a little far. For us, and we needed a lot more hands on and holding and bringing folks along. So, we did switch our consulting company to One Digital. You remember we, we did that. They have been much more responsive. They communicate very regularly with staff, send out what they call Brain Shark videos on whatever topics they get from staff. They give us one on one appointments, consultation visits, because a lot of staff said, Look, I just need to sit with somebody and say, This is my situation. These are the medicines I'm on. How much? Can I spend on this? Like, what is it? <laughs> so that's the issue. So this company is helping us do that. We have a lot more jumping onto the high deductible after going through some of the education uh, planning. Uh, so that will save later. Um, but it's also, it does get a lot of choices. And it still gives that zero dollar option for a single subscriber. Not a lot of districts are doing that anymore. Right. Yeah. Maybe with that. Yeah, yeah. we didn't see too many. So. Um, yeah, we're staying pretty competitive in that space, and that's something our, recruit, our recruiting efforts really focus on. Okay, maybe our salary initially isn't what this county is, but do you get this health insurance package? Do you get the tuition reimbursement rates? Do you get really awesome swag and all these appreciation gifts? And <laughs> and the, yeah, we build it up. So it's the best place to work. Uh, Commit to be fit is still going strong and doing lots of things, especially in the nutrition cafeteria space recently. We've seen a lot of press on that um, and the USDA grant. Uh, so there's Brian Bolmerick there in our <laughs> farm to table space and he's just taking the bull by the horn. So he is helping us impact uh, school nutrition at both schools with farm to table, with culinary. 
um, all of those aspects. So in our high school is doing an awesome job embracing the second chance breakfast, just won an award for that. So nutrition space, we're making a lot of these. Next, can you explain the second chance breakfast? Oh, hold on one second. Yeah. Yeah. Grant keep Brian for two years? Two years. And yes. Yeah, then we need them still. We do need them still. So we're going to sell USDA to keep that money coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're making a great impression. They love them too. And so uh -huh. does the BDOE. Yeah. And, uh, they love what we're doing. doing. So yeah. Um, I'm sure we will find support. <laughs> Don't worry, I will make that a point. Um, second Chance Breakfast. So yeah, um, Mr. Grove asked about what Second Chance Breakfast is. Schools now have uh, the ability to take advantage of what's called a breakfast after the bell. Um, and we were noticing kids come to school, they're gearing up, they're kind of sluggish. They weren't really participating in breakfast, especially in middle school, high school age. Um, and Second Chance Breakfast breaks up the day a little. Gives you a little time before you're ready to eat. I'm like that too. I don't like to eat when I first get up. It takes me until like 10 anyway to want to eat something. Um, but it, it gives that break. There's a natural um, tendency for teenagers to want to eat during that time frame and then wake up and be geared up. And we saw the results almost immediately. It helped, it really impacted our attendance and tardies. Our participation rate went up over 63% in breakfast participation which was something huge because in our cafeteria program as a whole, we needed a 16% increase at least in our participation rates to make a differential for community eligibility provision here for the elementary school. So to see those numbers, I was thrilled. So yes, we're, we're making those. Um, and next year, um, due to the change in the threshold at USDA from the, um, what was it, 35% or 40%? 40, thank you. 40% free and reduced lunch rate that you needed before, and now it's going down to 25% to qualify for community eligibility provision, which is free breakfast and lunch for all your children. So high school will get that next year. Yeah, we're very excited. This year we've offset lunch costs for our students through a grant through the Virginia Department of Health. We were able to tap in some of those funds to offer free lunch for high school. Um, so that's been very helpful as well. Big barrier for families right now. Um, bus replacement schedule is still there. We have to have one by state code. Uh, that's what we would like to do, <laughs> um, but funds sometimes prohibit it. We do have fairly reasonable mileage since we do combine our elementary school and high school ridership, so we have fewer miles than uh, what might be seen. Um, but that being said, we are, bus six keeps breaking down on us. <laughs> Uh, but our spare bus is looking kind of rough, so. So, just to be clear, uh, there's, I didn't see a bus anywhere in our plan. But here, it's got uh, the replacement years this year for yeah. 13 and 21. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the comments, so I see two buses that need to be replaced that are not. And we will probably not replace one of those bluebirds. One of them probably should be. They're very old, and those are our ADA compliant buses. So on those two, you have to have one. And we feel like with the need that we've seen over the last 20 years, you know, we, one would be sufficient. So we oh. should look toward replacing one. Um, but that's why we are in conversations with, with the county about capital and how we're going to grapple that long term. And buses are, are part of that, and that's why we have that long discussion right. with our joint meeting. You, you have to submit to the state what one would look like based on your fleet. Whether or not you can do it is another story, but um, that's what we would like to do. So the, the 13 and 21, are they handicapped buses? Yes. Mm -hmm. So they have a rent? Yes. So that costs a whole lot more? Costs about the same as your regular bus. Yes. Yeah. Um, so again, the optimizing the fleet presentation is there. You can see the cost. That one is still blows my mind. 68, 63, 68 percent increase in bus costs over the last since fiscal year 17. That's just astronomical. It's crazy. Uh, so that's something we have to come to terms with too, and decide whether do we want to bite the bullet and do a lease purchase agreement with the county and figure out something to keep the bus fleet going or or what. But that's going to be continued conversation because those costs are pretty high in the state doesn't give you much money toward that. We did use extra money in our last tranche, though, to buy a bus. That's where the, the newest one is, bus 17. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so our five-year capital improvement plan, we actually projected out about eight years to really give a good outlook at what's on the, on the radar. Um, and these are some of the things we'd like to do to continue to keep up on our regular maintenance, keep uh, the classrooms, remods going through the cycle, replacing everything that you need to replace. Um, so fiscal year 24, that'll be the last big uh, piece from our million dollars that we received from the, the ESSER funds for capital. And then each of those pieces each year after that are sort of what it would on our best estimate based on quotes that um, Dr. Bolts has received on various projects, what that, what that might look like uh, projected out. So for fiscal year 25, for instance, it's 255,000 for some of that work. We're putting the 200,000 infrastructure operations and then we'll do, she'll dig in a lot more with that budget too to see where she can, um, but certainly not everything might be done that's on the list. But that's, that's the plan. There's a lot of work that our auditorium needs. It's a big community space and it does cost quite a bit to get the work done that it needs with the, the sound and lighting and the rigging and the, all, all the sorts of stuff that uh, that needs. That is a big, um, a big cost. There is interest in doing a community campaign for, to raise that money, especially with the Arts Academy. So it's good timing to dovetail into that. So we feel like we'll be able to raise some of those funds. But that's your outlook. Uh, the big one that's still just kind of sitting out there, the, the only one that think, we think might surprise us a little, is the high school sand bed sewage treatment plan. And that one, they have yet to update the regs. They say it's coming, it's coming. It could be three years, it could be 10, it could be. Uh, and our best um, information that we have right now is that it's being pushed out. Um, There's 200,000-ish that they said to kind of hold on to for that that were to um, change. And that's pretty much everything. <laughs> Thank you so much to the school board members who give us the direction and priorities um, and to our county and our supervisors, Mr. Curry and Bonnie Jewell. Thank you so much for all you do to continue keep the dialogue going and um, I know support us in advocacy efforts for getting trying to get those extra funds. Sorry, we're trying. Um, but we appreciate you. Any questions about that part before I let Miss Witt get into the numbers. <laughs> well done. Really, really well done. Thank you. <laughs> Educational. Yeah. All right. Okay. So now, how we got to all those wonderful things. Um, the first thing was uh, to talk about where to changes concerning our staff members. Um, so the both houses put out that we needed to do a 3% increase for our entire staff. Um, they said SOQ, but like Dr. Grimsley, that is 0.95 of a principal, so it doesn't really work out that way for us. Um, so that will cost us $276,506. Um, and then on top of that, we were surprised with 11% health insurance increase this year, um, which the board decided to take on themselves. Um, and that will cost us an additional $141,093. Um, on <laughs> the good side, we did get a VRS reduction, but it is not a, enough to, to make a yeah, noticeable change in the, in the two other numbers that we have to incur. Um, through attrition and looking at the budget, Dr. Grimsley and uh, the, ad, the administrators found some places that we can save in positions. Um, so we did reduce our budget by five positions uh, this year. Um, two at the elementary, a teaching position and a aid position. Um, one aid position at the high school, one support staff member at the school board office, and a bus driver in transportation. Go down to 17. 17, yeah. I mean, just go down to 14. No, we had. Um, what was the question? Oh, I'm sorry. The I'm bus sorry. Driver. Yeah. We still have 15 routes. Uh, we did have one bus driver uh, that we could stick in as needed because our subs were so scarce. Uh, so we don't have that option anymore. <laughs> 
and we are still in dire need of substitute bus drivers if anybody wants to help us. And Dr. Grimsley does help out. <laughs> Two days for filling. <laughs> <laughs> we have a stop. She said no. <laughs> uh, revenue changes for the budget. Uh, like Dr. Grimsley said, we did the worst case scenario for revenue, um, and that was the house budget, which gave us a decrease in state funds from where we are this year um, of $60,848. Now, the conference budget does show an additional $212,000. Um, currently, so there is hope that there will be more state revenue coming for um, for recce in it. Um, federal funds, we did see a reduction in ESSER funds and a small reduction in flow through. And then our grants and other funds, just going back and looking at where we have been over previous years, um, I felt like we were in an okay position to add money uh, in that spot, um, just because we have to do appropriations throughout the years and other revenues. Um, so I feel confident that we'll be able to to receive those as well. Um, May I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. The um, state revenue possible increase, what's the timing on that? <laughs> yes. Not real sure. <laughs> so there's there is a veto session on April 17th, so that's when the governor will have another swath of the conference budget, and uh, so maybe we'll find out a little more by then, um, but they have till June 30th, really, to come up with their budget, so we've got to be done far before that. So. <laughs> yeah. I know, me too. It's definitely not fun. Um, additional changes affecting the budget are uh, we have an elementary school textbook adoption next year, which is cost roughly $50,000 in next year's budget. Um, and that, that is a one-time cost that will be in, that, in this current budget. Um, we did do a reduction of our career coach at the high school. Um, we adjusted salary scales for our custodians, our teacher's aides, and our food service workers um, to get them to $13.50 the minimum wage. So that also uh, affected this budget. And as shown in Dr. Grimsley's report, we also uh, redid the transportation salary scale to do five-year increases instead of the 10-year increases like we had before. Um, and we had increases to heating and fuel. Um, over the last couple of years, we've seen an increase in there. So we, we did allocate more money in those lines as well. Um, and then increase to maintenance and grounds lines. Those, the materials and supplies that, that we use in those have gone kind of through the roof lately. So uh, we had to do an increase there. Um, what and were those increases? Sorry, what were those numbers for I, increase in heating? And I don't have them with me on hand, but I can get them for you. I, I have the totals at the back um, okay. for, for the whole function. Um, but I can get those for you if you like. Um, and then an increase to the technology lines. Um, all of our software has increased over the last few years, so we've just um, taken, a, you know, done an increase in that to make sure that we have everything covered. And then the summary of all the expenses and the revenues, it's just a breakdown of each function of our budget and how we got to, um, the 725,000 that we are asking for additional funds from the county. Um, so it's a change in revenue and then, uh, you know, an, an expense increase of about $500,000. So, and this is all preliminary. It could change on the 17th, um, but this is worst case scenario, we hope. And something that you know, Stacy doesn't give herself enough credit, and Gail over here as well, our finance office, they do such a great job really watching each of those line items, and they do every single line. They look at especially those functions that you're ordering and working with vendors and shopping things out and, and monitoring, doing a five-year look back, what's the trend, and that's how they inform us, okay, this one is safe to reduce by this much. This one you're going to need an increase. Every year we're trying to pull somewhere else to fund paper or... <laughs> <laughs> she gets on for paper all the time. Um, but things like that. So yeah, they do a great job watching those line items and letting us know where we're, 
where we need to increase and where we need to decrease? Well, I mean, the expenses are not going to change. It's the revenue that might change yes. at this point. And this is based on 726 ADM? Mm -hmm. 728. I had 726 up there. Oh, 726. That's the last from the state. That's the last. Yep. All right. Well, that's pretty grim, right? And uh, <laughs> and we're not going to know anything new that would change this until after the deadline for us to get something across to the superintendent. Right. I know the county presents their budget tomorrow night, so we'll see how much of this or not that they put in there, so that will change too, what we have to, have to do. Um, so, just want to acknowledge, I wish that we could still do the 5% raise for our staff instead of the three. It would, they, they, would, they deserve it, and we can climb up. I know that if this isn't maybe the right time in the county, but just <laughs> it's interesting you know to me <clears throat> so much is dictated uh, to us um, uh, that I uh, I was sharing with a neighbor earlier tonight I'm wondering why I'm actually sitting here because I feel like I'm just a middleman uh, we do not have the liberty to not do the things they've directed us to do from Richmond and they all come associated with a cost and the money does not come from Richmond primarily um, so when everybody in Richmond has good ideas <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, the thing that they they don't understand and we heard from a representative from Roanoke City, I believe, who said that Rapanne County wasn't uh, paying its fair share uh, towards education. I think he forgot that we were paying 83% of the cost of education in our county, much unlike his. Um, uh, so it, 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 this budget, that where we're at with this budget tonight, uh, we had planned a work session next Tuesday. I cannot imagine anything changes between now and next Tuesday. And uh, certainly we can discuss this later in the agenda, but it seems to me like the numbers are what the numbers are. Uh, there's no sense uh, delaying things. It's not going to change in a week uh, or in two weeks. We have a deadline that's what, the end of the month? I mean, the absolute sure. deadline's the end of the month. Uh, but nothing's going to change before the end of the month. I would state revenue, and we, you know, and yeah, we state, don't know what the supervisor. We won't know state revenue. Right, right. I mean, that could be way down the road. Gary and Bonnie could, could tomorrow present that they want to give the schools a whole lot more money. Yeah. We know. <laughs> it, there's a lot of hard decisions, right? Uh, <laughs> and the supervisor said, "Hey, we're all drinking from the same well." <laughs> same team. So, so uh, anyway, I know that's going to come up. I thank you for the presentation and the education on on the budget and for the analysis that's been done. Uh, but you know, the numbers are what the numbers are. Uh, is there any other questions or comments before we move on? Anybody? Just want to commend it. You know, the budget is is built based on our our strategic plan, and I think that's the way it has to be, and that's where where the where the a dollar meet the road is where the education starts to be. And I, I just commend you all for that. It's just the right way to do it. Anyone else? Thank you for doing that uh, task uh, mm -hmm. again. Uh, uh, all right, uh, moving on. Then uh, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Grimson. And a great letter. What was that letter actually called? It wasn't the letter of the editor, it's called what? Oh, the op-ed? Op-ed. Op-ed. Op op sorry. <laughs> great letter, great education. Uh, I know it's frustrating uh, for you, it's frustrating for all of us. Uh, and uh, uh, 
Glenn. Let's move on. Uh, headwaters. Yes. Headwaters representative. Very good report. Yes. Ms. Bonnie. I, I was able to meet with Ms. Ginoli, and this is our report. Um, the Headwaters held the Next Step Expo. It was during the during the spring break in March, and there were ten seniors who attended. It was the first ever Next Step Expo, and many had their parents with them, and they received information regarding how to pay for college, how to communicate professionally, how to manage stress and anxiety, how to set goals, and how to receive support from a mentor if desired. There were. $2,000 in cash prizes and gifts distributed to that group of 10 people who came, or 10 who came, so it was worth their time, and I, I think that this is an event that will build in, in the future. Really good I heard, idea. I heard some really good feedback. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, really good idea. Good. And then Headwaters has received 23 scholarship applications from high school seniors, four funding requests from students who want to pursue trade programs at Laurel Ridge and 19 requests for funding from, from alumni who are currently in college. Scholarships awards are going to be announced in May. Headwaters and the schools had a productive and engaging meeting in late February and have agreed to collaborate on Headwaters annual fundraising event, which has changed this year. It will now be called Headwaters Harvest Festival and Student Showcase. It'll include craft vendors, children's activities, and a silent auction while also incorporating numerous student showcases from both schools. School programs that are at the table include FFA, Farm to Table, Steam Lab, Welding, Art Students, and Culinary, probably more. It will move from Eldon Farms to the elementary school this time and will be on October 5th, so save the date. And that is, Very that concludes. Very exciting. Thank you very much. Um, MBGS? We did meet. Yeah. There you go. Uh, <laughs> actually, if, if folks out there know of a physics teacher and a potential chemistry teacher, <laughs> not ours. <laughs> Don't take ours. <laughs> there's a possible, there's an opening for both, and uh, but those are just half time jobs, so it's just for our retirement. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> not going to do that. We have uh, one person with all of those endorsements, so no. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I am pleased to, to report that the uh, our, all of our kids at, that are at the governor's school, um, the foundation has been able to fund all of their uh, spring dual enrollment fees. Okay. So it yes. costs nothing for these kids because of the foundation uh, chipping in. Sure. Of those things. That was a good thing. Be good. And uh, you know, the, the other stuff we did was just approve the budget and the academic calendar and so forth. All right, thank you, Mr. Doe. All right, moving on to public comment. The first portion of public comment will be things that don't have anything to do with the budget. If you would like to address the board on something not related to the budget, would you come at this time? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure whether this is related to the budget. I'm Steph Ritter and, uh, from the Wakefield District. I was thinking that a lot of what happened in the Virginia legislature seemed to me a fundamental misunderstanding of the LCI. And I think next year we should, I, I, I'm pretty sure I can round up a bunch of people uh, to head down to Richmond and knock on door. You know, we were so sure that there wouldn't be a problem that we didn't actually, you know, push as hard as we could have. And I don't think, uh, I think next year we're not going to make that mistake. And we're just going to go in there and make sure that cap gets lifted. Because uh, I don't think that any recommendations from JLARC are going to be instituted in the very near future, so we're going to need to find money in the state. And um, I, said, I, I think we can find a number of people from Rappahannock who will go rap on those doors, write letters, make phone calls, and get people to understand. 
you know, the state has two conflicting policies. One is to educate children, and the other is to um, support agriculture. And we are really at the, we're in, a, in, in the horns of that dilemma, if you will, because we're in the crosshairs, because we're an agricultural county uh, with a school population where the parents are not very wealthy. And I don't think people in the legislature understand either of those two things, and that we need to go down and explain it to them more clearly. And the other thing is just also related that I'm, I'm worried about teacher retention. I think it's a statewide problem, and we're gonna, and I know it's true here. If you can think of ways that headwaters could be helpful. Uh, in terms of supporting teachers in any way um, or pro you know, providing ex extra support, you please let us know and then we'll do the fundraising around that. Thank you. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else this evening? Yes, ma'am. I just want to. Um, uh, congratulate or thank you, Rachel, for raising the 5%. As I look at these numbers, um, for starting salaries for both people with a master's degree and a bachelor's degree, and I think about what the um, average median income is for this region, which is over $90,000, or at least it was in uh, 2023. I don't think the new numbers for 24 come out. But there's no way that somebody with these salaries can afford to live in this county in today's with today's rent um, rent. So I I know this is a really tough year, um, but that five percent can make a big difference for some of those starting um, candidates. And if we're going to retain teachers and we're going to attract teachers, those numbers have got to start going up. Um, I know that, that you all work very hard, and I really appreciate what you do, but we got to do it better. Um, the other thing I wanted to do on a more positive um, note is to thank our CPS and uh, Headwaters and the 4-H and um, CCLC for working together to start to look at this summer. And it's been an amazing collaboration that was pulled together on very short notice, they got out in front of the issue of summer camp and summer school. And that's the kind of collaboration that we need to see a lot more of, not just for the summertime, but for year round. So thank you for jumping in there and taking the lead on that. And I hope that that will continue to develop into something even more expanded in the, in the upcoming year. Thank you. And would you, would you tell everybody? Oh, sorry, I'm Betsy Deedle from Whitefield. <laughs> just to make sure everybody knows. It's good just to make sure everybody knows who's talking to us. Thank you, Betsy. Is there anyone else? Yes, sir. Yes, I'll get the microphone right this time. Um, just briefly, it's been my experience that making money is a lot easier than asking for it. Um, I just wanted to extend Yancy Farm, my entrepreneurial company, if there's anything that we can do to help make money um, through programs, through um, building businesses with staff, with students, with parents, we're all about it. Um, whatever we can do to build exciting, innovative businesses, whether it's you know, selling wild lab tours around our panics, like, let's do that. Um, we have the tools, we have the, the space, we're all about helping. So. Anything Nancy Farm can do to help, we're all about it. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Locke, what district is your farm in? Um, my house that I call Yancey Farm um, is in the Piedmont district. Piedmont? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anyone else? We're running out of people. Sweet. <laughs> all right, we'll move on to the budget. So, anybody would like to address the board on the budget tonight? Budget topic. It's interesting because I mean, we have a document that tells us a lot about what's going on there. It's very transparent. And uh, 
unlike 25 years ago, uh, I don't see a lot of wiggle room. <laughs> All right, is there anyone? No, last call. All right, moving on to uh, action items in for the board. Uh, the recommendation for the calendar was to choose calendar number two. Is there a motion to adopt calendar two for the for sure, the Ruben. FY twenty five school year? A motion from Mr. Grove. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. Rubin. Is there any discussion? Just want to acknowledge that with the second poll, it was much closer, and it was forty five to fifty five percent. So I do anticipate that with the ever changing staff and demographic in our schools, for example, if people move from a private school that is used to having a week long spring break, they might, our, our demographic, our population of teachers and students is rapidly changing. And I would like to see in the future that we always have distinct and different options regarding the spring break um, because it does feel like there's a little bit of a tide moving, and I want us to be moving with our with the people who we currently serve. Um, being being that 45 percent of the teachers, that's just 10 teachers more than said they would like to have calendar B. I'm saying that there's only a 10 teacher difference who, who preferred yeah. the, preferred this, the, 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 the B calendar. Yes, um, and, and and my comment on that same idea is. Uh, when we do surveys, we got to make sure that the data is good. So I'm, I'm yeah. a little concerned. Maybe the way we posted it might have created anomalies, and so I don't even know if I should trust it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we need to figure out how to crack that nut too when we're when we're doing surveys. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But, uh, I would say something. I'm an advocate for a week long spring break. I'm likely going to lose this vote. I'm not done. <laughs> so, hopefully it will line up a little bit better with Easter in the years to come and, we won't, yeah, and yeah. people will be more receptive to looking at a week-long spring break on that holiday. But for me, it's a planning issue. It's being able to say this is how we're going to try to do the calendar every year and yeah. stick to something to help parents out and teachers. It's interesting uh, it, it, that we ask. You know, I think it's good that we ask. Yeah. But in the end, it's a democratic republic, and we're going to actually choose. Yeah, we're going to choose. We're, <laughs> it's we're not a democracy. <laughs> That's anyway, I'm happy to regardless, go half of the people will go home mad. So, <laughs> yeah. so we accomplished that. Or forty-three percent. All right, we have a we have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Uh, the motion is to uh, go with calendar option number two. Do we have that, Ms. Checka? We're good with that motion. Number two. Opposed. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. And the motion carries. Um, discussion on the budget. Um, uh, we've been discussing it while she was presenting it. I'm not sure if there's anything left to discuss at this point. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Rachel, I have one more question about the well, budget. Just, just um, to clarify the question, I thought it was a good. It's a good thing for us to just know what it would cost to do 4% and 5%. Do we have those numbers on hand? 4 and 5%? Well, yeah, or 4% or whichever numbers. I don't have them with me. I'm at the office, so I can get it to you. No, thank you. Well, maybe Shannon has it. Hold on, hold on. Just so that we know what we're talking about. If we can. The percent is usually around 75,000. That's what you said. 2%. It'd be another 150K for 500. 150,000 is. An amount, but it's 150 additional, right? I mean, 486, 987 for a five percent increase. I'm not, but I think we need some staff changes. Yeah, there have been a few staff changes that may change up from because we reduced, yeah. so it come down a little bit. But, but per, per percentage, it's still the seven, the sorry, well, 175. I mean, 75,000. Yeah. yeah, per percent, yeah, 75,000. So, I mean, so we can. If, if things come our way, I would like to prioritize that raise, you know, as, as the budget clarifies. So, okay, so if I'm understanding you correctly, so if that extra revenue came in, put it toward increasing the salary rather than trying to reduce the... If the governor was successful in putting our million dollars back? Well, that oh, that's, part, that's no, no problem. I'm saying, that. I'm saying with the, the conference budget, if there's a little more, you want any extra put at compensation. Oh. I, I, would, I would like to... 
propose that. that. I'm, I'm not, obviously I'm only one person, but I would love to see that. I'd love to see the school board trying to bring us into the ballpark of our peer institutions um, compensation wise. Is there any other discussion about that? Because uh, one of the things we'll discuss is whether we're ready to adopt a bottom line or whether we're going to delay a week and talk about it again. What does the board want to do tonight? Any discussion on that? Can we move to adopt a bottom line? We can, we can move to adopt a bottom line and send the budget across the road to the supervisor. Just ready to do it. We can move to adopt the same thing with 5%. We can move to leave it the way it is. Uh, but genuinely, nothing's going to change between now and next Tuesday. So it's fruitless for us to sit on it, unless there's something we want to wait discuss again. Send it across and see what comes back. Send it across with 5% or send it across with 3 Larry seems to be in favor of 5 Five. We favor five. So we send it across the street with five percent increase for all staff. That will That's change the bottom, line. the bottom line. Will have to be recalculated. Yes, we have to recalculate. Which means we'll need to meet next Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's what we'll do. We won't know that until we won't know what the county finally adopts until much later in the process. Anyway, so um, you could. Keep the bottom line with the understanding should additional revenue come through before, you know, that we would put it toward compensation. That's what I thought you were saying. Yeah, I, what I was saying was that, that was the sense. bottom line is saying the county wouldn't change or ask to the county's going to stay. But like, if we get additional revenue, we're going to put it toward compensation, is how I understood the question. From what I understood the discussion to be was that it's possible that revenue. state revenue will, will increase by 200000 mm -hmm. which means we could put that state, maintain the same request, but if that comes in, put that towards our originally desired 5% right, increase. The state revenue, we're only talking about section. a two year. So it just goes on and on. Yeah, it goes. Okay. Yeah, the, bottom, the bottom line is- Bottom line won't on. change. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to change the bottom line. I just want to, I just right, want but, to. But once we, I mean, the vote, the vote that we would take tonight is the bottom line. Vote. Yeah, the bottom line is what I wanted. I'm fine with this bottom line, just as it changes. You all will have to meet again anyway, eventually, down in the process, we'll depending on what happens so, to finalize. Well, that's time time so it's, it's okay right. to say. So know. here's the thing. We, yeah. we could vote to leave things the way they are and send the bottom line across the street. We're going to have to meet after we get information from the state and from our county to figure out how we're going to manage whatever we end up with anyway. Yes. Right. We can adjust it at that time. You can yeah, make adjustments. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. All right. That's a good plan. Yeah. No sense of lollygagging. So we. Uh, See, I jumped down to nine point one already. Uh, so this is our first opportunity to adopt the budget. So is there a motion we adopt the budget with the bottom line of where's that number? Ten. Is that the ten point one four two? Well, no, that's the county asked. Fifteen. It's fifteen. Fifteen fifty three. Fifteen million fifty three thousand three hundred and eighty seven dollars. Fifteen zero five three three eight seven. Correct. So we have a motion from Mr. Grove to adopt the agenda. That bottom line, is there a second? Second. Second for Mr. Rubin. Is there any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. So ordered regarding the calendar. I guess we don't need to meet next week. So that meeting, which would have been on the calendar, will not be happening. Do we have a motion to cancel that work session? Hey. Move that we cancel the work session. Motion was by Is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. Grove. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Being canceled.
You got all that, Gail? Yes. It's a fast moving train. <laughs> yeah. All right. Our next, uh, oh, is there any new business tonight? Hey, I have a question. Do we get an update on preschool? Do we know where that is? Um, so, preschool, um, we still have applications. CCLC. So we have started the collaboration with CCLC to begin the licensing process. It is really in depth and has a few barriers for us, like licensing wants to come in to see a space already set up the way they would need it, but all of our spaces are being used currently. So we said, well, this summer you can come in. So they have to help us with deadlines and timelines, but that conversation is going on. Applications are still open. We don't know where that'll end up. Usually we have a lot trickling in um, throughout April. Early May, like that's when we kind of have a better idea. But this year we were busting at the scenes at both locations and two classrooms here and the classrooms at CCLC. So hopefully, the hope is by providing that extra space here, licensed by CCLC, will free up a lot of the space that they're currently needing for infant toddler. You know, that is a big barrier for our working families here. They tell us all the time, even our own employees, that, you know, I'd love to give you full time. I can't, I can't have any work for my kids to go. You know, so this is a way we can work together to help the whole situation. So it's still yes, it's in the process. Forward. It's in process. Yes. But right, right now we're full. It's a waiting list? Uh, well, right now for this school year, yeah, we can't accept oh, it. For next year? For next year, we're still open. So we're taking applications right now. We haven't. Somebody told me it was full. We it. haven't closed it yet. Huh? We don't know that yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there any other new business? Um, we have one thing for the board. Just uh, there are new policies coming through, uh, so we'll, <laughs> we'll need to get our policy uh, folks together to review those for an adoption at one of the upcoming board meetings. So um, Gail will reach out to our policy. Who is our policy committee? I believe now it's Mr. Eugen. It's me and, and me. I think it's me no. and Mr. Eugen. Oh, yeah. oh, that's right. Mr. Mills and Mr. Eugen. Yes. All right. And Chris. You've got to read them all. And the nerve to ask who's on the policy committee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's quite a few to go through for our spring policy updates. So, um, And then some that are up in the air a little bit, depending on how legislation finishes out. But. All right, thank you, yes. Dr. Grimsley. Is there any request for future agenda items from the board? Our next meeting will be uh, in the library, uh, April the, no, March the 19th, no, April the 9th, right? Yes. This is March, yeah. April the 9th. Yes. And uh, a reminder, our work session's canceled next Tuesday. All right, this time we're going to go into closed session, and uh, how long are we going to be in closed session, do you think? 15, 15 minutes, and then we'll return from closed session, certify and have motions related to closed session items. You better get a motion first. Go ahead. Go ahead. You got it? Okay. I move the board convene into closed session for the following purpose. Discuss and consider the appointment of staff for classified positions, coaching positions, resignation of professional positions, and discussion of the superintendent's goals pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A1. There a motion, Mr. Groves. There a second. Second. Second, Mr. Rubin. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. So we're going to move to a new room. We'll be back shortly.